uh, Insightful Action Seminar. I'm very happy to be here with uh, Francois Bonici and with Cynthia Reina, uh, and also with Sheila, who's joining us online. Uh, this seminar series uh, brings together researchers and practitioners who are interested in system change, leadership, social impact, and also valuing learned, lived, and practiced uh, expertise and experiences. And by that, we mean, for example, people that have hands-on experiences uh, on the job, that learn through uh, their work experiences, for example, learned experiences that you get, for example, from these classes and seminars, and also from lived experiences, people that have gone through some sorts of uh, experiences, personal experiences related to their own identities uh, and shape the ways they see and experience uh, things in, in the world. Um, and this seminar, as Peter just described, is co-hosted with uh, the Executive MBA, uh, the go-to program, Global Opportunities and Threats. Um, let, uh, we're going to briefly start with an introduction of uh, the, the two uh, speakers here that are here in person in the Nelson Mandela Hall, uh, who wrote this book, The Systems Work of Systems Change, How to Harness Connection, Context, and Power to Cultivate Deep and Enduring Change. Uh, Cynthia Reina is a researcher, writer, and lecturer who's affiliated with the Bertha Center for Social Innovation at the University of Cape Town. Uh, Francois Bonici is a public health physician, also a social change practitioner, and a professor, and he currently serves as the director of the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship and uh, as head of social innovation at the World Economic Forum. And Sheila Patel, who is joining us online. Sheila, are you still there? Well, I hope she... Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I've just muted myself, so... Uh, there's a bit of a lag. Sheila, yeah. thank you for joining us. Sheila is the founding director of the Society for Promotion of Area Resource Centers and a co-founder of Slum Dwellers International, uh, an initiative that is featured in this book that was written by Cinta and Francois. And both organizations have an emphasis on guaranteeing the rights and improving the livelihoods of the urban poor. Um, I'm going to very briefly tell you how this event will be structured, so you have an idea of what you should expect. Um, we will start with uh, uh, a talk from Cynthia and Francois, who will provide us a snapshot of the book, and th they will tell us what inspired and what led them to write a book on systems change. Then Sheila will provide her reflections on uh, system change based on her own experiences as a system change leader, uh, and also from her insights reading the book. Uh, and this will be followed by a, a discussion that I will moderate, and then questions and answers from the audience, both in person and online. And that means because the event will be hybrid, uh, that there's a bit of housekeeping that I have to tell you as well. Uh, we uh, will uh, be taking questions in person from the audience, but because of many issues that are too complicated and I won't bother you, uh, I will have to repeat the questions after you ask them. So people who join online will be able to listen to these questions as well. And we will also take questions from the audience who will join us online. So please post your questions uh, um, on the, the chat, and we will be taking some of them. Um, I think that's it for the introduction. I would like to hand over to Francois and Cynthia, who will tell us a little bit about this excellent book, The Systems Work of Social Change. Francois and Cynthia. Thank you. Uh, I, I let me just go first on behalf of both of us. And just to say a big thank you to uh, the, the Skull Center team for uh, hosting us today, Peter. Uh, Mariah, Jessica, Paolo, it's really a, you know, an honor to be back here. I was actually in those seats not too, well, actually a while ago, 15, 16 years ago, uh, did my MBA here as a, a young recovering uh, public health uh, physician, not unlike Peter himself. Um, but we also really want to, to thank Sheila and wish that she was really up on stage here with us today for our first really in-person conversation about this book. This book, more than anything, you know, surfaces the work um, at one point, the, the alternative title for this book was called The Hidden Work. And I think that's what we want to 
spend time talking about today. And it's really a privilege uh, to have Sheila with us, uh, someone that's really inspired uh, our work for, for many years. So that's you know, really important for us uh, that, that she's with us. Thank you, Sheila. Um, and uh, a little bit, I think, of the journey. The book was born out of two things. One is a book born out of failure. Uh, I think uh, anyone who is you know, aware of how complex the challenges are that we're facing today, and we've just had two weeks of COP and recognizing the, you know, the depth of negotiations happening there and all the different dynamics, recognizes that most of our approaches up to now have been uh, at best uh, you know, uh, partly successful uh, and at worst potentially harming the, the, the challenges we're trying to solve in the first place. And, and you know, on a very personal level, um, in, in the work that we had done, inspired actually by uh, Side Business School and the Skoll Center, I established the Bertha Center for Social Innovation at the University of Cape Town. You know, one, recognizing that there was a huge degree of social innovation happening in a country like South Africa with its deep history of inequality, uh, of apartheid, of institutionalized oppression, and naively thinking, you know, some models of social entrepreneurship might be able to change some of those things. Uh, and quite, you know, quickly was, you know, schooled. Rather than being the school, we, we were schooled in many ways and thinking uh, about, well, what, what, you know, what, what really needs to be changing here. And it, it is the things that we're now, I think, and that COVID has, has shown us are these, what we know as systemic inequalities, systemic barriers, things that are structural, that are sometimes visible, uh, that are mindsets as well. And Cynthia and I were, were working together, we we're researching, we were teaching, we were creating communities of practice around thinking about deeper transformative change. Um, and I guess struggled in many ways, but also we were connecting to this global systems change conversation uh, and recognizing what we were seeing on the ground was somewhat different to the conversations that were happening uh, and that we were part of. Um, we were privileged to be part of Map the System and the kind of concept of apprenticing with the problem. And I think that was a really important starting point. Um, but what we recognized was that sometimes we shouldn't be the ones necessarily, you know, thinking about what change needs to happen, right? And, and were we actually the actors who should be creating that change? And that started us on, on a bit of a journey uh, to uh, do, you know, work with a number of organizations, but also go deeply into uh, and another alternative title of the book, which was what got us here won't get us there. A bit of a play on the title of one of those self-help books you can buy at the airport about your career progression, but it was using the we instead of the you. Uh, and it was a little bit of a, well, how did we get here? How did we get so stuck? And I think we felt stuck along with many others. And so joining the system change conversation and recognizing we're at the beginning of that conversation. Um, perhaps without going on too much longer to, to hand over to Cynthia to talk a little bit about the, 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 the journey of what we wrote about and, and why, uh, you know, and invite Sheila then into the conversation. Yeah, I think um, that, that journey that we've been on, it, it started quite a while back in the practice that we had, but then we were formally allowed to kind of think through the idea of systems change when we were invited by the Schwab Foundation to do a review of systems change across their portfolio of about 300 different organizations that they that they had dubbed social entrepreneurs. But um, fortunately for us, Schwab had had quite a uh, broad definition of social entrepreneurship. Um, but I think even for that time, so we were able to kind of dig into this database of about 300 organizations and really think about well, what does it mean to change a system? What does it mean to fundamentally make a system that's doing one thing do, do something else. And out of that, we chose six organizations that we felt were using different approaches. Um, we, did, we didn't even know what systems change meant at that time. This was about six years ago. The conversation was only just beginning. And so we knew that we wanted to incorporate systems thinking and system strategies into our research, but we also wanted to see what organizations were doing on the ground. We wanted this to be based in practice, not just on, on theory. And so with that um, small subset of six organizations, we started the research. We were able to go and visit these organizations, spend time really um, with them on the ground, understanding what they were doing, visiting the projects that they were working on, but also just having lots of conversations. Wow. Those conversations continued wow. for quite a long time. And 
and in fact, they started to, to blossom um, into other conversations with other organizations. And, and to be honest, what we found was not what we were expecting to find. Mm -hmm. So systems thinking theory was that we should find those organizations that came up with the perfect solution that they had mapped out this system that I, they had identified a, a wonderful systems intervention that they had used leverage points and tipping points and that they were then able to scale this so that everyone in the system was now doing things in a different way. That's not what we found. Um, instead, what we found was that organizations were using much different tactics to create systemic change than what we expected to find. Um, so we started to think about that term systems change is actually a, a term that we were uncomfortable with. Um, you know, who are really the change makers? Who, who is this kind of heroic actor that is going to change a system? Um, if, if it's actually groups of people, if it's, if it's kind of the day-to-day -day work that happens inside a system that makes the change, then this term systems change is actually maybe leading us down a, 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 the wrong path. So we started calling it systems work. Actually, I think it was Francois who said, I think, I think we should call it systems work because it's actually about the day-to-day -day work that we do um, and that others are inspired to do um, and that um, happens in a tactical way, a very practical way um, that makes systems change in more healthy and productive and, and just and inclusive ways. Um, so not to kind of jump too far ahead, but we, um, we identified three principles um, and we're gonna be talking about with Sheila about these principles in practice. Um, but the first of those is, is a very relational principle and that's around fostering of connection. So many of these organizations had tried to do that strategy of working with individual behavior change, creating an intervention, making people behave in different ways and then shifting a system. But oftentimes they had to backtrack and go in a different direction. They started working with groups of people fostering a sense of collective identity, fostering a sense of community. Um, oftentimes the very individuals that they were working with, that community was happening spontaneously and emergently. And the solutions then became part of that community. They were not brought from the outside in, but they were homegrown and organically built from within the system itself. The second principle that we identified was, uh, we called it embracing context. So a lot of the systems thinking is about um, kind of the application of silver bullet solutions um, across a system. But what we instead saw was that many of these organizations were working in very local, very important community-based ways to ensure that problem solvers on the ground were able to make these adaptive decisions on a day-to-day -day basis that actually started to coalesce into broader themes and patterns. Um, so we called that equipping problem solvers um, but in the broader context, it's about how do you embrace context and not make blanket solutions. And then the third piece, and really this one was the one that really took us into places that we didn't even know we were going to go, is we called it reconfigure power. Mm -hmm. So if the systems are in fact operating the way they are because of the power dynamics that are in perpetuity because power exists to perpetuate power, how are these organizations, how were these organizations um, actually existing to in fact invert those power dynamics or change those power dynamics fundamentally? And we found that these organizations were working in extremely deep ways to ensure that people in power were no longer the decision makers or were sharing power or transitioning power over to those who actually have lived experience of the problem itself. And we, we can talk about how that's being done um, across many organizations, but I think we're lucky to have Sheila here because she can talk about this um, in a very practical, very uh, real way. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, description and for providing us some of the highlights of the, of the book and also telling a little bit about this journey. Um, Sheila, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi, Sheila. I'm not Hi. allowed to start. I'm not allowed to start my video. I think your studio has to do that. Okay, uh, so we're gonna show a three minutes video that introduces right. SDI, uh, and then we, we bring you back. Uh, okay. Can you, Good. Can you please run the video?
Hello, Sheila. Hi. Sheila, thank you for joining us. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your experiences with uh, being a systems leader and also your reflections on, on the book and, and on other uh, stories that might have been similar and, 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 and some, some of the insights that you gleaned from the book? Uh, I'd encourage everybody to read the book because it gives a very interesting set of new language uh, that is necessary for those of us who work in this very important and emerging space uh, with those who are in other walks of life with whom we have to interact in order to address this terrible growing and intergenerational poverty that we are seeing across the world, now both in the North and the South. So uh, having said that, since we have a very short time, uh, let me start off, let me start off by, uh, first of all, uh, paying to my mentor, who was a carpenter by profession and became, he was working with in Mumbai, uh, thought, using a range of very intuitive strategies. Uh, they could not stop the eviction, but they were able to produce a relocation that was designed and managed by them. This was as far back as 1975. I met Jokin in 1986 when I set up along with others, this organization called Spark, where a bunch of 15 crazy grassroots professional activists decided that we were fed up of doing projects. We were fed up of being told by other agencies about what's good for slum dwellers. And we said, let's look at ways by which we could start behaving like partners in change. And we created an organization of women's collectives, which we called Maila Milan, and we created a and, and Jokin's organization, the National Slum Dwellers Federation, was already working in eight cities in about five uh, states of India. Uh, by 1990, we had started working in 60 cities in about eight states. And what we realized is that every local challenge that communities faced, be it water, sanitation, uh, being picked up by the police, uh, not being able to get birth certificates, getting no IDs, whatever you felt gave you identity in the city was not provided to them. We realized that if we studied that process along with communities, we found a way out and we were able to create a mechanism by which the first 50 with whom we set what we call a precedent we were able to produce a exponential growth of the process until it became either a city, a state or a national policy. In 1992, we were invited to South Africa by, uh, by the Council of Churches to meet the 80 leaders of uh, black townships to talk about the transformation of habitat in the post-apartheid period. And we helped set up the South African Homeless People's Federations with a small NGO to develop a, a version of what we were doing there. And in the last 20 years, we now work in 33 countries in about 250 cities. We have some basic rituals and practices that help communities take charge of their lives, collect data that they can aggregate and disaggregate. They learn to make large collective representations. They demonstrate solutions that work for them, but which breach all the rules 
of the city. And then we, because we operated from local to global, we use sometimes the global to push the national, sometimes the national to push the local. The idea is that for cities, all the five levels from very local to global have a role to play in cities because cities are global spaces. And so when I read about this book, we all get what we call an aha moment. Oh, oh we did this. Oh, this is what we're doing. We get words, we get, uh, we get uh, justifications and we get validation for the things that we're doing. So by and large, our, uh, you know, if we take uh, Cynthia's uh, three very important principles, the most important thing is that you have to do things extremely locally, but you may have to work at city, national, and sometimes global level, and you need institutional arrangements to do that. Those, those relationships are not created by a good management theory. And I, all, I have many friends who have come out of schools like yours, and we are always arguing and fighting because I always tell them that you, you use an efficiency model. We use a model to produce political breakthroughs and they have different pathways. And hopefully our pathways will lead to management systems that work for us. But we cannot get management systems to work before the political exclusionary practices are allowed to stay on so that you just keep doing what we all call band-aid work of projects. So we feel that, and, and, and Joachim taught us this, he says, you have to make friends with your worst enemy in the next five years. If you can't do that, that means you don't know how to negotiate. And one of the most important principles in SDI is to negotiate for the greater good. Uh, all of us as young grassroots activists, you know, uh, and, you know, sometimes uh, rabid feminists of the 70s, we were really, really upset when women from communities initially told us, we don't want to talk about patriarchy and how our family is abusing us. The family is, and the community is our safety net. We don't have any other safety net. So create conditions by which we bring such amazing goods and services to our communities and our houses that they transform the way they look at us. And we begin by changing power relationships in our homes, in our neighborhoods. And so that's the other very, very important thing that we do. And this is a universal system of how we work. The third thing we believe is poor people don't trust professionals when they say it's good for you, because it's not. It doesn't take into consideration what poor people need, want, aspire to have. So we say, let the professionals provide a platform for you to design and put together the ingredients of the strategy that you want. And once it works in one area, it is shared like a recipe. This is one of my favorite ways of explanation. Uh, when you like food that somebody cooks, you ask for the recipe. When you go home, you find three of the ingredients just don't exist. And then you have to substitute them, you have to change it. And maybe that, uh, that, uh, that food product will be completely different, but it was inspired, it used the process, and a lot of our innovations, the ones that you saw come out of things like that. And finally, we believe that uh, we are all in the global South victims of Northern colonial city planning that was designed for extractive purposes. Our elite find that very comfortable and they have not changed it. And therefore the way to change that has to be to produce another logic. And I can tell you that while uh, a lot of the global uh, resilience building in the climate change adaptation space is very critical. It is left to the innovative and entrepreneurial 
potential of local communities to actually produce solutions, fight for them, and globalize the legitimacy of doing that. And so within the, this present COP, our role has been to raise the flag of adaptation, saying adaptation is a local activity. It cannot be done by the UN. It has to be done by local people, local communities, in relationship to all the power bearers that they have. And it has to change that balance. So I'll stop there because I think I see these as very common threads in the other case studies, uh, many of whom are of my friends. We are a very small group of people who have uh, fought against the, uh, the, the, the sort of duplication and systemic management styles that are increasingly being imposed upon us by development theory builders and financers. And we look for, uh, for, for an engagement and a conversation. In fact, uh, I'm probably going to work with uh, with the race to resilience to produce a measurement metrics that must make sense to poor women in designing, uh, in identifying problems, in designing solutions, and then mapping their impact. That should aggregate into all these sophisticated uh, digital excitement that uh, all of us have today in the development space. So thank you very much. Back to you. Thank you very much, Sheila. I'm fascinated by your experiences and I, I could take like three hours just bombarding you with questions. So I'm gonna have <laughs> to uh, be very disciplined here and, and prioritize a few. Uh, but I would like to start with the question that arose a lot from our discussions, including with the executive MBA students uh, here that had some classes on systems change this week, uh, that uh, when we, we talk about systems change and interventions on, uh, for systems change, uh, a lot of people normally ask, like, how can I start, right? Like, that, that's a, a question. Like, we're talking about very complex problems, and sometimes it leads to a position of fatalism, like nothing is possible with the resources we have available because these problems are just so complex. And on the other hand, we also have these hero entrepreneurs who normally uh, portray themselves as having special skills and, and, and normally overemphasize the impacts they have. And your experiences shy away from these two traps, right? Like being completely disenfranchised and feeling that you can't do anything, but also not overvaluing the role of a single actor or, or a single individual. Uh, so if you can provide us some, some insights on uh, and to prospective systems leaders here in the room and also who joined online, what would you suggest? How, how can we start these pursuits for systems change? Uh, what, well, the methodology that we usually use is to look at what has produced these intergenerational poverty frameworks. You know, because 20, 20 years ago when we started SDI, we didn't, we didn't even acknowledge how many generations of people who were living in informal settlements were facing this. And we began to acknowledge it when women started saying, I want to do this work so that my grandchild, not my child, my grandchild doesn't face it. So you got this amazing contradiction or paradox of a deep commitment to participate in making change happen, but a deep insight that something as chronic as you know, this pervasive poverty is not going to magically change. And so when you start with that, you start with what are the things that community women prioritize and what we find uh, in, in, um, in, in, in our federation language, in, in Hindi, we have this term called Sao uh, Khichidi Kitapeli, means you have a hundred pots of stews that are cooking all over the place with fires that are at different levels, with different permutation combinations. And you keep nurturing them and taking care of them and helping each group to nurture their cooking pot 
And then when that food is cooked, everybody comes to taste it because it produces a solution that addresses what needs to change. And a very, very critical and important thing in this process is the power and the imagery of agency, saying that poor women and poor communities are not consumers and beneficiaries of everybody else's largess. They contribute maximally to their own survival. And so we said that what can we do to improve this process, to fix the leaky bucket? And when you start with that, that leaky bucket could be no water, bad water, too much water, too much heat, uh, uh, you know, no food to eat, no work, uh, no transport, uh, no, no documentation in the city, uh, constant evictions. These are the major things. And, oh, and gradually and patiently, these solutions are looked at and the methodologies that communities have produced negotiations require the politician the bureaucrat or the technician to come and meet 150 or 50 to 500 women sitting there saying this is what we want now tell us how we're going to get it because that balances the power equation uh, we've we've We've, I've been part of a, the most exhilarating situation of getting what in India we call ration cards, which is subsidized food where pavement dwellers couldn't get it. And the women said, we'll make so much noise in that man's office that he won't be able to do any work. And they took their babies and they pinched their buttocks until all those babies were crying and screaming. And we got, we got that inspector to come and give the first 50 women their ration cards, which before we got our national ID was the main ID card that you had in the city. So every city, every community has stories like this, but the power of STI is that we aggregate it. So we aggregate it across countries, across cities. And, and once that aggregation is seen, it transforms the way people look at us. And to answer the specific question which you were saying, Paolo, one of the problems in today's development is, as I call it, development consultants are like Excel sheet maniacs. You know, you take, you say there are 1 billion people, if you want to give them a house, which is worth so much, it's so much money, so many trillion dollars. No, we don't have that. So we don't take it. But the funny thing about poor people's housing is that 93% of them build their own houses over time. And whether it's South Africa, India, Brazil, Mexico, all these countries that have humongous volumes of money for people's subsidy hasn't even reached 10 to 15% people. So you forget what people do for themselves. You forget how to quantify, uh, you know, what, what they do, how they do it, what systems do they use. And so our job as professionals working with them is to, you know, it's like we have to, we have to make those processes shine and get legitimacy. And the volume of our work is often what gets us those things. I hope I didn't go off too much from what you asked me. No, you, you did answer beautifully, and I agree with you about the Excel sheets, and I think we would bond really well because I, I'm also really bad with Excel and not a big fan. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love uh, Excel sheets, but I don't I, like the legitimation of not doing anything because of what the bottom number says. Yeah, <laughs> um, I, I, I really like the way you described how you you focus on aggregating experiences that aren't diffused, that are local, but you also bring that to the global level, local, global, respecting context, respecting uh, the characteristics of, of different contexts. Uh, and I, I would like to, to ask Francois and Cynthia, uh, what do you think about, and you describe really beautifully in your book, the idea of platforms, for example, and how to uh, force the connections. Can you tell us a little bit about that and also other possible ways to start this pursuit for systems change? 
Should I talk I'm about, about platforms and I'll okay. have another comment. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so well, this, is, this is a long-term <laughs> marriage that we've had. Our editor <laughs> describes himself as a marriage counselor. <laughs> writing a book with someone uh, yes um it was a five-year endeavor so we really have gotten to know each other over this five years um actually the, the the idea of a platform came from sdi from our research on sdi because we uh, sheila i love what you said about the management consultants don't 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 see this sort of management structure as as legitimate um because what we were looking at we we couldn't identify it looked like an inverted pyramid, but then it was three dimensional. There were all sorts of things happening in this organization that we couldn't look at our standard organizational charts and kind of put it on top. And, and so we started to think about, well, what, what do we call that? And we knew that platform is a loaded term. It's a trendy term and we, we were hesitant to use it. Um, but we also felt that network was too agnostic. It was, you know, for us, networks are often about kind of every, everyone coming together and sharing ideas, but not with the intentionality that we were seeing with SDI. So we started to use this term platform and see if it could if it could work. And in fact, the more we thought about all of the organizations that we were researching, we were realizing that the intentionality of who comes into the platform, what tools are provided, how they connect, how they visit one another, how these local contexts get trickled upwards and then trickle downwards, it really did feel like there were um, parallels to technology platforms. And in fact, many of them that we were researching were technology enabled, um, very data um, heavy, lots of circulation of data, lots of circulation of stories. Um, and this ability to kind of connect with one another was, was really the key to all of that. Um, but SDI was kind of the, 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 the poster child for us for how to build these people platforms. So not technology platforms, but people, people platforms that allow these really micro practices to actually become quite large scale and shift global, global transnational systems. We clearly have been together. She took all my talking points. <laughs> <laughs> but just to, to, to add on, um, thank you, Sheila. <laughs> uh, the other organizations we looked at, I think platforms are, do, do a couple of things. One is it's, it is about power. And if we think about, you know, just we've been through two weeks of COP, you know, who are the powers there? Who's making the decisions? You know, it was the, the governments in power that were negotiating and uh, the lobbyists and uh, the corporate actors. So largely there were social movements, there were young people, et cetera. And those, the, the only time voices were heard when, when, when there was a platform created and those created by movements, but also by the kinds of organizing that SDI do. And then I wanted to also point out uh, all these other technology platforms that were not only about raising up, you know, voices, data, information, but also about the distribution of, of who gets to see that data. And I think we're sitting in a university also thinking about, you know, we're researchers, we wrote a book. Here we are sitting on stage talking about this, you know, to whom, who gets to use that data, who gets to be informed by that data. What I think has been so powerful by the organizations we've seen, they've put the information and data in the hands of people who can then make decisions, but also actually take action on them. And so another organization, I think, um, that we studied, which is a slightly different, more uh, a kind of a, a social enterprise, for-profit business, um, 40 million euro turnover, didn't have a chief marketing officer, an HR officer, or a finance officer until quite recently, totally distributed, where uh, essentially it's like uh, home care uh, nursing, uh, in small communities, but where the, the within a community they had you know, almost complete control and power to make decisions about what was needed, where resources need to go, uh, etc. And so the the use of technology was actually very powerful in some of the, the cases to actually enable uh, the what we call primary actors, people with kind of lived and learned experiences, to be able to actually make decisions about what was happening. So I think it's has this kind of the platform approach had both the distributing function, but also the kind of raising function when we're talking about power. And I think uh, some of you in the uh, Ember also looked at the Nidan case uh, recently. Uh, and obviously that's something that Cynthia and I wrote together as well, uh, which also focuses on this kind of context of building uh, platforms to address power. And I think maybe just one last comment um, that Cynthia mentioned as well is that while a lot of this looks like quite micro practices, and you know, sometimes we get, okay, how is this really about system change? But uh, our kind of our whole thesis here is that that is the kind of system change that we need to see, because otherwise we're redesigning systems to benefit the same people that are currently benefiting from today's system. So we might have 
systems change, but not necessarily changing who's designed that, who gets to benefit from it. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. And I, I, I also want to ask a question that relates to what you just said. Uh, and, and, and also Sheila criticized uh, how business schools and, and, and management scholars have been uh, talking about impact and not from a perspective of individuals who have lived through these experiences. So I would like to ask uh, you, Sheila, uh, how can we do better? How, uh, what should we do in the ways we teach, we communicate, we do research uh, to learn from, from your lived and practiced experiences and, uh, and how we can describe uh, and, and engage with stories like yours in, that are not necessarily limited to a single organization, right? Like you work in so many contexts and normally the case studies that we work with are uh, of single organizations trying to drive impact, but we're talking about systems change and it goes beyond the boundaries of single organizations. Well, uh, I think that uh, the most important thing for me is, uh, is you know, this concept of appreciating paradigms that you're either hostile to or you don't understand. You know, very often we are very comfortable in the knowledge framework that uh, we have been taught. And uh, if you look at more Southern education, whether you're learning history, geography, you're learning any subject, uh, you are learning, I mean, most of us uh, learned I learned more about uh, um, little wars in little England than I did about the subcontinent and the millions of kings and queens who went all over East Asia. I learned about that much later in my life. So what it's telling you is that education, knowledge that is produced also has political dimensions. And... Uh, and and the issue is not to berate it, but to be, but to be able to go beyond the, the content to understand why was it produced? How was it produced? Who did it service? And these are the questions that help us because they're very simple questions, but they help us understand very complex imageries on the basis of which we make choices. So another very interesting thing, you know, we, we, we get, you know, now most of our reviews are done by management consultants and I hate them. And I hate them because they don't have the tools to look at us. And they, you know, uh, and, and so what happens is that they look at everything that happens on the ground as messy, uncontrollable, uh, full of risks, and they come to me and said, Mrs. Patel, you, you know, your reputation is at stake because of, you know, the, you know, it all looks too messy. Somebody can come and say this is all wrong. And I said, no, uh, why do you think like that? Why don't you come? Why, why do you come for a three day visit? Why don't you come for eight days? Why don't you come for a week? Just sit in the communities, just listen and talk to them. And that's the other point as professionals, especially very technical and very prestigious institutions produce extremely snobbish and very, very difficult people to get anybody to, you know, to listen to anybody. And I have many of them in my own family. So I fight with them all the time, not to say that they're bad or wrong, but to say that you are limiting your potential by looking at what works for, you know, what works for only about the top 30 percentile of the city. That's what is happening today uh, with what big businesses are doing, what global businesses are doing, even what local people are imitating. So I think that the important thing, and then we all celebrate when one management student or one uh, MIT student goes and does something in some slums and we think it's terrific but it's dysfunctional because it doesn't produce a, a, a practice that becomes universal, that produces new language, new knowledge, new ways of thinking. And I think everybody in your class should read the Oxfam 
report, which Francois, you had publicized a lot last uh, last year or this year in the Davos event, if you remember. I think uh, Amitabh Behrs did that. I mean, it's shocking. I mean, we all have to look at that, that 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 seventy five percent of wealth is owned by fifteen percent people. The same problem with land. The same problem with wages. Is this the kind of world we want to live in? Because that's what most of the institutional arrangements are today promoting. If I could be rude and say that. <laughs> uh, I well, I agree with everything you said. I also. Agree. I think that it's obscene the level of inequality that we have, and and thanks for for sharing uh, your your opinions and values as well. I think it resonates with a lot of people here in the room. Um, I, I would like to to ask uh, Francois and Cynthia. Uh, you've been writing a lot of cases, and sometimes you don't even call them cases, right? Uh, on systems change, uh, what does it change when you're covering systems change? How is that different, the way that you look at these change-making processes? This is, this, is my, this, this is my pet project right now. Thank you, Paolo. Did you kind of just hand that to me? Thank you. That's a gift. <laughs> um, through the course of writing the book, through the course of writing case studies about systems change, uh, I think Francois and I both became uncomfortable with the way we perpetuate these narratives of the hero through our case writing. Oftentimes it's single individuals, single organizations that are heroicized and they're seen as the kind of systems changers. And in fact, I think that in itself is a, is a destructive concept. We, we can certainly change systems, but if we want to change them in healthy ways, then we have to work in collectives and we have to work in community. And oftentimes, in fact, most times, those of us in positions of privilege are not the ones who should be shifting the systems. Um, we can create platforms, we can create um, the conditions for change, but ultimately, if change is to be healthy and productive and, um, and inclusive, then we need to kind of get out of the, we need to get out of the way. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking actually of one case study and it's about um, an organization called Family Independence International, um, headed up by a man named Maurizio Miller. And he talks about how um, he had to fire people in his organization who were helping. Uh, he had to fire four people exactly. And the reason why he found out they were helping was because they were spending too much time actually on um, the, the work that in fact was the work of the families themselves. Um, and so by kind of putting in the hands of people who are most inclined to be able to deal with the complexity of change that in the way it needs to happen, he's shifted the dynamics. Um, but I think our stories don't, don't, don't show that. Our stories, in fact, often replicate these other narratives, which is about um, individuals and often Global North individuals changing systems. And we need to change the way we tell stories if we want to tell stories of systems change in, in better, more productive ways. I'm aware of time and that you probably have some audience questions. Uh, if I can have the moderator or... Sure, yeah. So uh, let's take some, some questions from the audience. I don't want to be too greedy. I have many questions here lined up, but I will share with you the, <laughs> the room to ask questions. Um, Lydia, my colleague is with some mics. If you can raise your hands if you, if you have questions. Oh, well, in, any question from the, the audience? That, no. Not for not, now. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'll ask another question in that case. Uh, the, the book covers three attributes of system change that I, I thought were really interesting and a really interesting way of describing and thinking of system change, complexity, depth, and scale. Mm -hmm. uh, and in our research here at the, the Skoll Center, research that was spearheaded by my colleague, Mark Petreska, we identified uh, that some global funders in the social impact space who are trying to drive systems change were focusing on scaling up. So replicating practices that were successful in some places 
in other places. And some other global funders, and especially the ones based in the global south, were more focused on scaling deep, so establishing stronger ties with local communities and trying to change institutions, trying to change policies. So much more similar to the approach that uh, Sheila described, but Sheila also covers from deep to up, right? Like she provides a learning a movement that combines or, or engages local practices and, and changing local policies, but also with global platforms where these practices can be shared, learned, and can cross fertilize. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about these challenges of combining depth and scale? Uh, and perhaps provide a, a glimpse of all the stories that you came across and that you featured in your book. Yeah, I'll, I'll have a start. And I think just thanks to Sheila always for, you know, a humbling conversation. I've taken enough notes here for another book. But uh, uh, <laughs> Sheila, thank you again. Uh, I, I think, um, you know, I think we've, as we've approached the system change conversation, we looked at systems thinking, it's been around for quite some time, it's a very helpful primer and starting point to say, okay, okay, it's more than, you know, the approach that we're, that our education systems have taught us to default and try and go and fix problems, right? So I think the systems thinking and the complexity mindset has helped us, but it hasn't told us kind of how and what to do, right? Uh, and, and I think we as a kind of community who've been thinking and working around social change and social enterprise have been obsessed with scale, right? Like, okay, we just, we've just got to do more because we recognize the scale of the problems. The scale is real, but we think, you know, we've, we've been obsessed with organizational scale. And, and I think what we have wanted to bring into this kind of conversation around system change is that depth component is really about, uh, you know, longer transformative changes require maybe sometimes slower process. While at the time there's an urgency, as we've heard, you know, the work that, that, that Sheila and some of the other organizations have done has really been over decades, right? And has been deep, highly relational work that has been able to build, you know, the, the collective power for some of this longer change, but also in a way that is far more self-determined uh, rather than throw, saying, you know, as some donors are going, you know, let's throw hundred million dollars at the problem. That'll, you know, that'll create systems change. Uh, because we have a solution that works. Um, I don't know, Cynthia, if you have a, one or two examples you want to share from, from the book as well. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the, the, the first chapter of the book is actually called The Industry of Social Change, um, where we go through kind of 200 years of social change making. And we, we really debated whether or not to even include it in the book because we felt like taking a whole chapter to do this felt a little bit indulgent. Um, but in fact, what we realized was that by going through the research and understanding what does 200 years of change making look like, we really started to identify the paradigm that we apply today. And it's, it's an industrial mindset. You know, the, the, the 200 years of, of social change making has happened in parallel with an industrialization of our economies across the world. And so this idea that we can manufacture social change by replicating perfect solutions as if we are scientists in a lab um, is, is, is how we come at the problem. Um, but it's certainly not the way we're gonna get the solutions that we want, the outcomes that we want. And so by focusing on the process of change and really understanding the conditions that we create for future adaptations is a far different approach. We called it economies of trust. Um, and those economies of trust are not the economies of efficiency that we are taught in business school. Um, they're the things that we learn on the ground in community on a day-to-day -day basis when we're actually trying to create change in these highly relational ways. Um, and we did see this across all of the organizations that we studied, most of them in the global south, actually. So it's interesting that, that you found these kind of two um, different paradigms for scaling of social change, because it, it definitely mimics what we found as well. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. And also, I, I'm, I'm wondering, and I read in, in your book that you describe organizations of contradictions, right? Like, and, and how some, some movements and, 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 and systems leaders uh, join groups that, when the, where they face a lot of contradictions and tensions and different interests, different values. How do we reconcile? Do we have to reconcile first? And how do we bridge them in a way that is productive and that we engage with collaborative action uh, to pursue common goals? Well, 
I mean, Sheila was talking, you know, the, the, the advice she had or the, the challenge she had from Jokin was to go and, you know, partner with your enemy. And it also just reminded me, I think many of you will have seen in the global news, uh, the, the death of uh, the last apartheid president and sitting on the Nelson Mandela stage and thinking about the relationship they had. You know, it was actually, you know, while there was a personal connection, they actually had significant disagreements along the way, but recognized when they needed to hold hands and work together and do that as a signal, and when they needed to do that behind closed doors, uh, and when they were fundamentally in opposition and had to walk in different ways. And so there is, you know, th that's a really interesting time to be reflecting on that now as we're, you know, both ending COP and recognizing we've got some very difficult tensions of pure contradiction that we're facing but we have to find those moments to to then say well, how do we see those pieces together and i think what you know sheila's shown and so many of the other organizations have shown is we can only also do that actively when there is an organization of people whose voices that has not been included in the conversation with whom you know many of us have been making decisions on behalf of as part of that kind of journey that we need to walk together Thank you. Uh, Sheila, just to end the, the, the talk, and I know that we are running out of time, we would love to hear about your experiences at COP26 and uh, your, your takeaways and your role uh, in, in the, the resilience discussions. Uh, well, the, you know, my, uh, I was about, uh, you know, a year before the Paris Agreement, uh, Mary Robinson, who, by the way, I met at Davos for the first time, and she's my most dear friend, uh, pushed me to get involved with climate justice issues in the climate change discussions. And I refused to go to Paris. I said, I have nothing to do. All the climate people that I meet are all elitists talking about the blue sky and you know, and all poor people are polluters. I don't want to talk to them. I'm giving my own example. These were my prejudices based on my experience in Mumbai, where uh, poor people always went and uh, built houses in, and killed all the marshlands and everything. And so rather than looking at why people were invading land versus uh, what what should environmentalists do? It was like a battle there. But through that process, I began to understand the deep connection between the climate challenge and the development challenge and, and all the contradictions that, uh, like Francois said, are emerging every day in whatever we do. So uh, my role in in especially in the last three years when I've become much more involved, started when I was on the commission for uh, adaptation and more recently when I was invited to be the ambassador for the race to resilience by the climate champions. And basically what I realized is that, all, you, know, you know, like the people who work on forests work with some people working on tribal issues or indigenous groups, ocean people work with some fisher folk. But really there are 10 to 15 very serious global uh, uh, movements that have so much uh, to contribute to and I for us uh, got a voice and a space in what is called the resilience hub. And as a result of that, we have begun to scope out the politics of climate change in ways that we didn't do before. And we're now using the same strategies in understanding the climate space. And our biggest breakthrough is that the SDGs and the climate change process are two sides of the same coin. They're not different. And yet it's very convenient for many development people to say, oh, we're only looking at SDG data. We're only looking at climate data. It's not like that. So I think that of all the movements have been deeply, deeply impacted by climate challenges. We didn't have words for them. We didn't have an analytical framework for them. And I think uh, our, our big challenge in the next year 
is to just like in the habitat space, we produced aggregated and disaggregated data to show what needs to be done. We have to do the same thing in the climate space, and we have to do it with uh, organizing with universities, with scientists, with technology providers, and again deal with people who are generally very, very patronizing to the urban poor. But now we are much more smart about how to negotiate those spaces than we were 25 years ago. So everybody feels that the 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 what is called the blue zone where all the negotiators were working uh, we don't know we don't know what impact that will have because there are so many tensions there but i think that uh, that that many many networks and movements across different kinds of organizations different geographies we feel good about that Thank you and very much. People are listening now to this thing. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very I've much done. for joining us, Sheila. Thank you very much, Cynthia and Francois. This was a pleasure. And I hope you all uh, leave with some good answers, but also with some new questions on how to approach and pursue system change. Thanks, everyone. If I can do a little shout out, I think our editor, Adam Swallow from Oxford University Press, I saw his name pop up there. So Adam, thank you so much. Uh, we're here in Oxford and I think Mark Ventresco was there as well. So uh, a big thanks to, to Mark for your support over the years. And, uh, you know, when I was in those seats as well, uh, and I don't know sure if Danny was there, the former deputy director of the Skoll Center, I think who was mentioned, I'm just seeing on the chat, but uh, a special shout out and thank you from us and thank you for hosting us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, don't forget to sell the book, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think Adam was writing it on the Zoom chat. Uh, there are a couple here, obviously, on the OUP website. Uh, the Kindle version, Oxford University Press have been amazing in negotiating a, uh, I think it's one pound on Kindle uh, on Amazon.co.uk until the end of the year to make it accessible for anyone who wants to read it. But please buy the hard copy version so OUP can continue to thrive for centuries to come. <laughs> we also have some flyers, I think, that they are handing There's a promotional out code, the, I think. The promo code, yeah. where you can get it discounted on the hard copy. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>